Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 13, Episode 46. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Glad you guys are back with us here this Friday as the Pittsburgh Steelers are getting ready to return to the field and play host to the New Orleans Saints this Sunday at 1 o'clock Eastern Time. And we're uh, we're having a battle on our our end as well. You didn't get fooled by any fake Twitter accounts, have you? I know <laughs> I know you you had that warning out to to the group, which is good because it has been messy lately. Yeah, uh, it's a whole new world right now on Twitter for sure. You got to be you almost have to memorize usernames, and you have to look at things like you know four times to make sure because there's a lot of that uh, a lot of that fake stuff going around right now for sure. Looks like Twitter just suspended that uh, Twitter blue program. So maybe it would be a little bit easier. But but all that aside here, um, getting ready for this week 10 game between the Steelers and Saints. A little bit later in the show, we'll have a Saints beat writer and a great one at that on in Nick Underhill. Be sure to follow him on Twitter at Nick Underhill uh, at Nick underscore Underhill. He writes for New Orleans dot football and does a tremendous job. So we'll talk to him in a little bit, but we'll start things off, Dave, with the Pittsburgh Steelers and their injury situation. And we have to start with um, a couple of, of roster moves this team has made, most notably kicker Chris Boswell officially landing on injured reserve during the Wednesday show. We, uh, While we were recording, the team signed Matthew Wright, and we speculated that that almost certainly meant that Boswell was going to go to IR. That move made official um, since then. And so Wright will be this team's kicker for at least the next four games while Boswell recovers from that groin injury. So that is, a, uh, you know, Wright's a, a good kicker, and his leg has improved a, a ton since he came into the league with Pittsburgh back in 2019, but still certainly a, a downgrade for the Steelers. Yeah, it is. And in a game that, uh, you know, you, you could come down to one kick, uh, and, and Boswell obviously been kicking good for quite a quite a while now and knows the and kicking and a lot <laughs> kicking and, a and lot kicking issues. a lot and uh knows the ins and outs uh obviously of uh uh Ackershire stadium formerly known as Heinz field and uh i think the what i don't know you, you probably got the heat on this morning right and it's supposed to get a little bit cold uh in fact i think uh there might even be a chance of maybe a flurry or two on sunday there so uh uh you don't like to have to keep changing those things out there on, you know, in, in, in your kicking game there. And, you know, a week after having Nick Skiba uh, kick for you, now you're going to have another kicker in Matthew Wright, who obviously does have some familiarity uh, of, 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 of some sense and you know, was obviously kicking good uh, when asked to do so uh, with the Chiefs there. But it's just one other thing that uh, – you know, hopefully you don't have to overcome, you know, hopefully it's not an issue and you don't have to overcome anything when it comes to that. Yeah, it looks like for Sunday kickoff, 40 degrees and windy, 13 mile an hour wind. And so welcome to Pittsburgh. Welcome back to Pittsburgh, Matthew Wright. Um, with Boswell going to IR, the team was able to activate the Monte Casey. And so he will uh, make his Steelers debut on Sunday and TJ Watt should uh, also come off of IR. That'll happen on Saturday. The team has extra time with him. Casey, the deadline, that 21 day window closed up on Thursday. So they had to activate him. And so they did. And so this team, well, losing Boswell should get reinforcements in Casey. And of course, headlined by TJ Watt. Yeah. And I guess the question becomes is uh, who, you know, what's the reciprocal move going to be uh, with the, with, with, with TJ, what we think it's going to, we thought all along, I think that it, that it would be a corner, but now <laughs> which corner, uh, 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 now, uh, you know, Witherspoon, uh, hasn't practiced this week because of a hands hamstring injury, uh, new corner, uh, William Jackson's not practicing with that back. Uh, and, you know, for, for a while, I think initially we thought, you know, assuming this team came out of the bye week fully healthy, we thought, well, maybe Josh Jackson would be uh, the, uh, the 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 one to, to, you know, to make room for Watt. Well, uh, Jackson's healthy, so he's got that going for him, so I doubt it's going to be him. So uh, I would think it's going to be one of these corners 
maybe going to IR, and it might be Witherspoon, Alex. And what if it's Jackson? My goodness, you make that trade, and the guy goes to IR. I mean, he's, he practiced on he practiced last Wednesday, the day after he got traded over from Washington to Pittsburgh, and then did not practice Monday and has not practiced Wednesday, Thursday, and I presume probably will not be practicing today. Jerry Dulock reporting that Jackson expected to miss this uh, weekend's game, which is you know makes sense considering his newness to the team and, and lack of practice reps. So. Listen, I know they, they have little investment in him in terms of the draft capital, but this team's gotten good at trading for guys who are injured. And it's not like that injury was hidden or unknown, like a Brandon Boykin situation from years ago had the back injury in Washington, has not played since week five. And it may be just a one week thing. He gets back to week 12 potentially, but that is certainly frustrating and not what you want to see fresh off of trading for the guy. Yeah, exactly. And as far as the rest of the injury report goes, well, you know, uh, we just said William Jackson and Akella Witherspoon have not practiced this this week. Uh, Lisa Levi Wallace has had a couple of back to back uh, full practices, so he should be good to go. Uh, Miles Jack, what's going to mm-hmm. happen with him, uh, Alex? And, and, you know, that's something that uh, I don't think either one of us expected to see really on the injury report this week. But he has not practiced the first two days. And now Friday, Makes you kind of wonder what's going to happen on Friday. Could could he be one of these guys that are uh, that's ruled out? Jack obviously leads the team uh, in, in 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 total tackles there, and a the guy that's played obviously a, a lot of snaps here uh, for this defense. And I guess really the only uh, you know one of the positive things I guess to come out of the Thursday injury report there is Larry Ogan Joby was limited uh, with that knee, but. You know, I you know, maybe just seeing how he can do, and you know, Friday's going to be a a telltale sign, you know, for Ogan Joby. But uh, if this team doesn't have Miles Jack, you know, if he ends up getting ruled out, that's obviously uh, big. Uh, you do have you know uh, Casey back on this roster. Maybe you can do some a little bit, you know, a few more things with maybe some three safety uh, stuff, and 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 Casey kind of that you know quasi linebacker in there, but. You know, on on the surface, anyway, you're probably going to see a lot of snaps with Devin Bush and 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 Robert Spillane in some base situations there. Yeah, Dave, we'll have to see on Miles Jack, and you know, I, I'd like to think maybe he does something on Friday and can can play on Sunday, but we'll just have to to wait and see on that one. But certainly not a name to overlook. And as you mentioned, should he not be able to play, then we would expect uh, Robert Spillane to start, and Mark Robinson probably gets a helmet as well. But at corner, we'll have to see how that looks. I'm not quite sure how that's going to shake out, um, assuming the Witherspoon and Jackson miss. I assume Levi Wallace will start at a left corner, and then maybe James Pierre will, will rotate in some sub packet situations whenever Cam Sutton bumps inside. So, um, you know, the, the secondary has just never been able to be quite healthy enough this year, and that's certainly been one of the many issues this team has faced. Yeah, and uh, this is a team that's given up a lot of explosive plays, way too many explosive plays. And, you know, the big news, obviously, you, you know, the, you hope that uh, in, in, you know, barring something unforeseen, uh, TJ Watt will be back and that'll give a huge boost to this. And I guess kind of the to hear, to hear to hear, you know, Terrell Austin talk that, you know, they, they might try to have him on some sort of pitch count. The moment I saw that come out on Thursday, I'm not buying it. <laughs> uh, Same. Uh, this is a guy in TJ Watt that's talked uh, this, this, these last, what, two weeks or whatever, uh, how much he misses football and can't wait to get back out there. And, and uh, this is a guy that's hard to pull off the field in any situation. If he is given a helmet to get on that field, on Sunday, I mean, sure, you you might have six or seven, eight plays that he's off the field, but I, I don't really consider that a pitch count when it comes to to uh, to TJ Watt. I'll be pretty shocked if TJ doesn't play. I don't know what eighty five percent of the snaps uh, on 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 Sunday there. So uh, uh, they're saying one thing, but I'll, I'll believe the whole pitch count thing uh, after the game if his snap total is more around the, I don't know, 60 to 70% range. Sure. I understand conditioning is an aspect of it, but it's TJ Watt and and good luck telling him to come off the field on a big third down. Um, don't mean to interrupt here too much. This, this may be more relevant to you. I know the name, but according to TMC Gallagher has died at 76 years old. So uh, the comedian there, so just passing wow. that along. That's, yeah. yeah very, very sad. Uh, the old, uh, the old uh, uh, sledge matic right? Right. He had the, the show where he would smash fruit and watermelons and all that kind of stuff in front of the crowd. So yeah. uh, apparently he has passed away at 76. 
Wow. Very okay. sad there. Um, to, I'm, to make I'm a, surprised you know who that is, because that's more of a comedian from from my my era. You know, uh, I like comedy. That's kind of a little bit of, of something that I that I dabble in some of the older stand up comedians. I, I don't never really watch them, but just aware of him because of the, the, the uniqueness of the act there. But anyway, mm-hmm. to make a, a really bad segue into the Saints injury report situation, as Nick Underhill will talk about a little bit later in the show, Saints dealing with a ton of injuries um, to their offensive line. Sounds like. Center Eric McCoy, very likely to miss this game. Same with linebacker Pete Warner, their leading tackler, and potentially some other names as well. And so that's a team that's dealt with injuries um, for a bulk of the season, especially in the secondary. And they probably will still be without guys like uh, Marcus Lattimore. But uh, they're going to miss, it appears they're going to miss some some key pieces in, in Warner and Eric McCoy and potentially others. Man, if you ever wanted things to kind of set up, uh, you know, uh, in, in an NFL week, sort of kind of in your favor, I guess, if you will, uh, not only do you have the saints coming to Pittsburgh, uh, you have them doing so on a short week, you have them doing so with, you know, the, you know, yeah, the Steelers have a long injury list here, but you, you look at what's going on with, with, with new Orleans, uh, kind of beat up and they're probably not going to have McCoy at center, uh, Andres Pete. And we'll, we'll see what happens there. It doesn't sound great for him. You're already going to probably have to take uh, Caesar uh, Caesar Ruiz over to center. Uh, Throckmorton, who uh, really could be somebody that you go after uh, at left guard there. Who knows who's going to play right guard, but that's that's obviously a matchup that you would think that would favor a guy like, like, uh, like Cameron Hayward over there. And then... You know that they've they've had an issue or two at 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 at, at left tackle with with giving up pressure. Their best guy over there is Ryan Ramsick, uh, the right tackle, and you know he's obviously a former Wisconsin player. And him and T.J. Watt played at w- Wisconsin, and and those two had a battle in 2018. They they probably know each other pretty well uh, overall there. But uh, you just look at their offensive line. We'll see if Jarvis Landry makes it back for him. Uh, a very notable injury in Pete Warner on the defensive side of football. As uh, as we talked to uh, Nick Underhill, Marcus May showed up on the injury report with an abdomen uh, injury for them. Uh, you, you know. Yeah, both teams aren't fully healthy, but uh, the Saints are really limping into this and on a short week at that. And that is the subject of my terrible take today. If if Pittsburgh can't win this game, then what game can they win? Because this is so set up perfectly for them. And even though they have so many issues of of their own um, and and they can't score, I mean, every just on paper aspect, being at home with the bye, a healthier team against the team on a short week on the road with their injuries. I mean, if they can't win this game, then. This this optimism we may have slightly about a better second half of the season probably evaporates if they can't beat the Saints this weekend. And look, we we have been as hard on this 2022 Steelers team as anybody, right? And knowing knowing their their deficiencies, especially on offense, and they you know the defense obviously hasn't played up to par. You look at the explosive plays that they've given up, but you're and, and I threw this out uh, on on Twitter last night suffering through that uh, Falcons Panthers game. You look at both those teams and those teams are still on the schedule in, in, in December. And I kind of threw out there, man, uh, if if the Steelers can't beat either one of those teams talking about the Panthers or, or, or or the Falcons yikes. And I think right now you you head into this game with, with the same feeling uh, uh, about the saints. If they can't beat the saints, Yikes, you know, especially off of the bye week and having all this time and, 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 and yada, yada there. So getting Watt back. I mean, yeah. it's perfect for Pittsburgh to finally win a game. What, what else do you want here? And look, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, uh, it, it's, it's still, you know, when we went through the schedule the other day and thinking, you know, how many, how many games and I think I was, a, I was one more, I was one more game optimist, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, optimist than you were there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, I, I'm, you know, some of these, some of these games you should win, and 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 this really I feel is one of them. Uh, yeah, agreed, one hundred percent. And so we'll give our predictions a little, a little bit later, but that might I think be I already did. I said I think I did as well, <laughs> but uh, we'll we'll see how that goes. Um, for the co- coordinator corner, uh, Matt Canada, Terrell Austin speaking every Thursday. Again, not a whole lot there, although Matt Canada, I think he. I don't know. It was a little cranky or something in that interview. A little testy with some of the answers, although some of the questions probably don't 
deserve or you know, require great answers, but uh, Canada just seemed a little. It's a, we can only have the transcripts. We don't have the actual uh, video to be, right. you get some of the context and vocal cues and stuff like that. But basically, was asked about this team needing to score more, and uh, you know, so many words. He said, "Quote." Uh, that's what we want. Good call. That's a great idea. So that's where the, the Steelers offense currently sits. Yeah. Uh, who knew that uh, coordinator uh, interviews would be such a uh, kept thing. Uh, if you're listening to this, you ought to email uh, the Steelers, you know, or, or get on them on social media and start trying to get them to release these coordinator videos because you get a lot of context that way. And Lord knows the beat writers don't write about you know, uh, hardly anything that these coordinators say in a given week there. But uh, that aside, at least, you know, we're thankful to get some some transcripts here. Uh, yeah, I, he was a little at least it sounds like he was a little bit tested here. I think the biggest thing here and, and you're not going to get a good answer out of him, uh, anyway here, you know, about the whole self-evaluation. And, you know, he was asked, I think, if he watched any any other games and you know, didn't really give great answers on that. But I, I think the biggest question here is, you know, what's going to happen this week with 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 the running back distribution or or workload here? Uh, there's been a lot of speculation. I think Mike Florio from Pro Football Talk even come out and said uh, his sources indicate that, the, that, that we'll see a bigger workload from Jalen Warren this week. Although Jalen Warren, I think, was asked in the locker room, I think, yesterday uh, and said, really, he hasn't seen an increase in reps or anything along those lines there. Uh, but I, you know, overall, I, you know, to your point there, they, they didn't get a lot out, out of Matt Canada. And I think he, you know, you had that stat come out from, from Warren Sharp this week that, and, and this is something I've been tracking as well too. the Steelers longest uh, touchdown passing touchdown or touchdown period uh, uh, this year's eight yards. And that goes back to the uh, game against the new England Patriots Trubisky to Pat Fryermuth. Uh It's not even close when it comes to second place there. I think uh, who is it? the, 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 the chargers or the Rams or something has uh, their shortest touchdown uh, or their longest touchdown of the season. I, I should say is like 23 or 25 or something yards uh, along those lines there. So uh, we got to start seeing this offense uh, start, you know, a, if they get down in the red zone, got to bury all these red zone opportunities because they're few and far between, but it mm -hmm. would be nice to start seeing some of these, you know, to not have to work so hard uh, for some of these touchdowns. Uh, uh, this team struggles to get double explosive plays. This team could very could 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 really use, you know, a twenty two you know some some touchdowns from further out here in 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 this offense. And this team coming off the bye week now, you would think that they've had, you know, there, there's some other things to look at self scouting, to look at your tendencies, and to purposely go into this game with tendency breakers, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think that's what the bye week is for, is for evaluating yourself and, and what your tendencies are and how teams are, are, are playing you and how you can try to, to build off of that. Canada did briefly talk about Jalen Warren and, and comment on the job that he's done, saying, quote, he's elevated and he's done a great job, so we'll continue to use him. And we got to get the ball to the guys who are making plays, end quote. And Warren, one of those guys certainly making plays on the relatively limited opportunity that he's had this year. And so we'll just have to see how that shakes out again. Warren has been, and will continue to be this team's third down back. And so that's a role that I don't think it's talked about enough for him um, in terms of getting, you know, quality snaps and, and, and big time situational snaps. And I think he will see the ball a bit more on early downs, but I'll be re really watching for that in particular. How much action does he see on first and second down? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and and I, per, you know, I think that they need to do a more concerted effort to get him, you know, a few more snaps and and, and get the football in his hands. Yeah, and we shall see. Um, they need guys that that are producing, and Warren's one of those guys who is producing right now. So to flip over to Terrell Austin, uh, you mentioned about you know him hinting at T.J. Watt being on some sort of snap count, saying he probably won't be a sixty play guy. We'll see, but I think he'll play close to what, what is a normal uh, workload for, for TJ Watt. Uh, DeMonte Casey officially returning, coming off of injured reserve, so he will play after missing um, the entire regular season, breaking his forearm in the preseason finale against Detroit. And so I imagine we'll see, to some extent, those three safety packages. Um, as Mike Tomlin outlined on Tuesday, they typically come against 12 personnel. 
teams that have more athleticism at tight end. And the Saints have a couple of guys, Juwan Johnson, Adam Troutman, and Taysom Hill, whatever you want to call him. So I think you'll see Casey out there for, depends on circumstance, but I would probably say somewhere seven to 10 plays. Uh, I, and I, that's another guy that we've talked about quite a bit, you know, uh, leading up to him coming back here, a guy that played very, very well, I thought during the preseason. And it was a shame that they didn't have him uh, at the start of the season here. And it will be interesting to see uh, how they use and, and, and especially when, uh, you know, there, there's a possibility that miles Jack a won't play uh, or B could be extremely limited if he does. Yeah, I don't really see a, a, anything between Jack and Casey, but I just think it'll be an extra defensive wrinkle. And, and I did write, and I still think it's true overall. I just that, think it gives you another opportunity to, you know, to maybe get him in on the field in some situations if you don't have a guy uh, uh, like Jack out there. Well, if they're in 12 personnel, you want two inside linebackers on the field. And, and Spillane's, you know, a guy that can play the run. So I imagine Spillane will still be out there in those moments. But, you know, I, I, I don't want to be too... Um, hypocritical, but I think TJ Watts returns really important because it will simplify the defense overall in terms of not needing to have so many different packages and so many variations and all the different people needed to, to try to replace TJ Watt. That was not a one man job, but I do think you still will, will and can have defensive wrinkles, including that three safety package that has that combination of Casey being a guy that that's downhill, aggressive, quick trigger plays to run well, while also giving you um, some coverage ability against some of those tight ends against the play pass game and things like that. And really it just makes that defense more versatile to allow Minka to spin down. I have a video coming out on Steelers Depot for tomorrow that highlights some of the stuff they were doing briefly in the preseason that kind of shows how Casey can, can allow Minka and to a lesser extent Edmonds to move around and, and allow those guys to make plays. Well, what'd you put the snap? Uh, uh, what What's a good over under snap count on Casey seven and a half. I have a, I think it's in my Friday five in terms of I have a specific number I can try to pull it up, but, but around there, I mean, whatever number you want to put it at is, is good with me. Um, let me pull up what I have in my Friday five for you guys to answer. I had over or under 10. Maybe that's a little bit heavy. Maybe I should go a little bit under that in my own post, but we'll, we'll, let's call it eight. Uh, I'll take the over. All right. Um, I'll go under. I guess I'll be contrarian and go under. Okay. All right. But I think we'll see him, and it is a wrinkle. And, and it, against a team like Baltimore, you can really lean on that. That that's where that you know package and, and grouping really comes in handy. Okay. Anything else from Austin or Canada uh, that I missed? Again, probably not a lot. I mean, you know, Austin talked about the ripple effect that Watts' uh, return will bring, and I think that's in, in some sense intuitive and obvious. But you know, whenever you watch this team, all the you know, I know Kim Hayward said he'll still get doubled, but I promise you, teams won't be able to slide to his side. The center can't slide to Hayward's side the way they were doing it without uh, TJ Watt on the field. So I think that's going to be a really big benefit for him in this pass rush. Boy, depending on how these injuries shake out for that Saints offensive line, this could be a real tasty matchup for Cameron Hayward. Uh, right. right. You know, th- 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 this, this could be one of those games where Cameron Hayward has, you know, two and a half sacks, a uh, 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 batted down pass, uh, you know, uh, just that that kind of thing. Because it, the, uh, as you mentioned, if you get uh, T.J. Watt back, even though you're know, Ryan Ram six over on that side, and uh, look, I, I think that you probably should uh, the Steelers should should seriously considering uh, consider blitzing a little bit in this game as well too. You know, to hopefully keep uh, uh, keep uh, 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 Kamara kind of tied in the backfield a little bit. You know, something to think about there, especially on you know uh, you know obviously uh, you know passing down type situations in there because Kamara is second on this team in 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 in, in receiving, and uh, you'd have to think because of you know the, the offensive line concerns that Andy Dalton's probably going to try to get the ball out quick you know, in, 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 in this one as well. Yeah. Um, I know that in my, my scouting report that maybe you blitz the inside linebackers a bit and you don't have to be ultra aggressive, but maybe you do some of that just to keep the back end. So Kamara has to pass protect because I don't really want Bush or Jack or Spillane or whoever trying to, you know, cover Kamara on some of these option routes and Texas routes and check down opportunities. I mean, he is their second best receiver on the team behind Chris Olave. So Maybe you'd find some ways to to try to minimize his pass game work by blitzing to, to, to have him stay in. I think this team will run a lot of games and twists. I thought New Orleans was struggling with some of that before all the injuries. Certainly, now that they have all the injuries to the offensive line at center, potentially left guard, 
and all the shifting that comes along with that. I think this team, I think Kim Hayward, Alex Highsmith will, will run a ton of stunts and twists in this game to really try to test and stress that Saints offense on the road. I agree. Yep. All right. I think that probably covers the uh, coordinator corner well. And so since we're talking Saints right now, let's bring in our uh, beat writer of the week. That is Nick Underhill, who covers the Saints for New Orleans dot football and the NOF network. You can and should follow Nick on Twitter at Nick underscore Underhill. We'll take a break and come back with him. Okay, welcome back to the Terrible Podcast. It is Friday, and with the Pittsburgh Steelers set to host the New Orleans Saints on Sunday at Acrisure Stadium, uh, we are pleased to have a beat writer on once again who covers the opposition uh, this week, with it being the New Orleans Saints, an old friend, a friend that hasn't been on the show since, uh, I think, 2018, the last time these two teams got together. We are, of, we are of course, talking about Nick Under. Hill. Uh, Nick has covered the Saints since, oh Lord, 2014, I think, something like that. Uh, he used to work uh, all over the place. I think he was at The Athletic. I think even the Times Picune. He now has his own independent. Uh, he's gone the independent route there, uh, and you can find his work at New NewOrleans.Football and you can follow Nick on Twitter at Nick underscore underhill and we'll have that link uh, of course on twitter we'll have that link in the post for this show as well too so with that nick welcome back to the terrible podcast with dave and alex hey appreciate you guys having me happy to be here uh great great uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, i you're obviously gearing up and I, I would suppose getting ready to make the trip up to uh up to pittsburgh to watch the game there uh let's start first uh nick with uh man the injury report here the saints coming off of the uh short week having played the baltimore ravens on monday night football uh they had some kind of what what looks like key injuries in that game uh they also had a couple of guys that that, that have been out a while too so uh uh obviously friday will be the key key injury report here and that hasn't come out just yet but uh on your take of things it, it certainly looked from the outside here that Eric McCoy the center is going to miss this game with a uh with a calf injury uh I don't know what what I, you know Andres Pete uh, that's an interesting guy to show up on the uh injury report this week and then Pete Werner is the other big one that I saw happen uh the other night against the uh against the Ravens there with an ankle it doesn't look like he's gonna make this game uh what's what's kind of your take on the guys that'll be in in or out this week yeah, it's looking really, really bad for them this week. Marshawn Lattimore, their number one cornerback, he has a uh, kidney injury that, and he's been out for four or five weeks now. He, he probably isn't going to play in this game. So that that's a major injury for them. Uh, Marcus May, their starting safety opposite, Tyron Matthew, showed up on the injury report yesterday with an abdomen injury, did not practice. That's another major injury for them. As you said, the two guys on the offensive line, Eric McCoy's in a walking boot. So I would be surprised if he sheds that and plays by Sunday. So he's almost certainly out. Andrews Pete with the tricep out too. So that's two guys on that, uh, defensive line that, that pro or offensive line. I'm sorry that, that aren't going to be playing it. And they just had a lot of issues with Baltimore last week, which is some of the uh, creative ways they rushed the passer in, in Pittsburgh, obviously falls into that same, uh, ideal, you know, trying to do things to confuse the offensive line and, and bring creative pressures and, and all that stuff. So that could be a, a major, major situation uh, for the Saints this week. And Andy Dalton last week, you know, things sped up for him a little bit, even when pressure wasn't coming. It, it kind of looked like he had a little bit of uh, discomfort just overall, knowing that they were able to get after him even when they weren't there. So that could be something that, that could definitely be exploited this week. And, and you mentioned Pete Werner. I mean, he's arguably been the best player on their defense this year. They've had a lot of tackling issues, a lot of missed tackles. He's kind of been a guy that cleans up a, a lot of stuff for them, has a lot of range at linebacker. Demario Davis, the other linebacker, is is still really good, but you know, Werner's the more athletic guy out of the two at this point in their career. So that's a uh, another situation to watch. So I mean, there's just you know, the amount of injuries on on this team right now are, are just borderline unbelievable and this seems to be maybe uh the worst of it for them so they're going to be probably extremely depleted this weekend uh when you look at uh what they did the other night obviously uh ruiz slid over there to center and 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 Throck morton i think uh the kid out of uh, oregon uh came in there and played at right guard what's going to happen if uh if P 
Pete, who, who's going to be there at the uh, left guard spot if, if Pete can't play? I would guess right now, and we usually get a better feel for, you know, how, how things are going to shake out on Fridays, a, a Friday's practice that's coming in a, a few hours. So I'm guessing right here, just educated guess. I, I would go with Lewis Kidd probably. He's an undrafted rookie. They liked him. He's He's gotten some snaps uh, in, in other situations where there's been injuries, but he um he's far from a sure thing at, at that spot. And if he does play, I mean, I, I think they're going to have to try to find a way to provide him with a lot of help and, and try to keep uh, him in advantageous situations, which is it, it's going to be tough. I mean, that's definitely a spot that I would try to attack. If not him, they just signed Derek Kelly, veteran offensive lineman. He has some... Uh, familiarity with this system he got signed to the practice squad I, I could definitely see him possibly getting elevated and, and playing that spot I do think it will be Ruiz at center and that's that's unfortunate for him he's had a uh, a tough transition to the NFL his first two years in the league were really just not great I mean he came in as a center they moved him to guard injuries had him going back and forth between the two spots and he never really settled in to either one of them this year, he's been a really good, legitimately good right guard. He knows what he's doing. He's he's things have slowed down for him. He's really settled in there. And now you got the injury, and and he's shifting back probably to center again this week. So that could take him out of out of kind of his comfort zone and and create another vulnerable situation for this offensive line. So that that whole interior. I mean, I would go out there and just do like a double. A gap blitz like right off the bat and just see if they can pick it up and then just keep running them and running them and running them. And, and, you know, if they can't, that's a, uh, you know, a, a major advantage for, for the Steelers potentially. Do you think Jarvis Landry is going to make it back for this game or no? It looks like he's progressing the right way. Um, he, he practiced last week, wasn't quite ready to play. He was limited, uh, on Thursday. They, they didn't practice on Wednesday. They use a pr preparation recovery coming off the Monday night game. Um, so far, it looks like he's on the right track. But, man, these injuries with this team have lingered so long in weird ways this year. Like, I'm reluctant to to put my name on anything right. uh, with that. But I, I, I do think that there's probably a, a pretty solid chance that he plays in this game. Nick, lots of new faces for this Saints team, including a quarterback with Andy Dalton. What led into the decision weeks ago to kind of stick with him? I know Winston believed he was hurt, but whenever he got healthy, they still decided to go with Dalton, who Pittsburgh will face on Sunday. Um, why him? And has that changed the structure of the offense at all, going from Winston to Dalton? It, it's definitely changed the way they they play offense a, a little bit. I mean, he he's done a good job of getting the ball out to Alvin Kamara and shorter passes and just... They've been in more rhythm, and it's become a more run-based team with with him at quarterback. And obviously, I think part of that is just due to the fact that they've been able to, to stay in some of these games a, a little bit better early on. So I think that was probably always the approach, but they got way behind against the Falcons in week one with Winston, got behind against Carolina week two. And, you know, I think it's just kind of, or I'm sorry, week three in the Tampa game was just, they ran well, but it just, they got behind and then they lost the game once it got to that point in week two. But um, Dalton's kind of kept them in games early on and they've been in the, you know, a little bit more rhythm, but I think they've kind of reached the end of the line on that as well. The Thursday night game against Arizona, two pick sixes, another interception, uh, Cincinnati, they get down to a four minute situation. They need a first down to win the game. They can't get the first down. Dalton becomes inaccurate. They get the ball back. They can't, uh, score again at the end of that game. And then, um, last week he, he kind of folded a, a little bit too. I mean, there's been some good moments in there, but it's kind of, you know, everything needs to be perfect around him for him to operate. And this team is, is far from perfect. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's the biggest issue with them right now is their, their identity and the way they built, they believe that they could be a team that could rely on that defense and, and, you know, their special teams always being great in the offense just kind of needed to be, uh, you know, in, in, sure of offense kind of so to speak a game manager just not not win because the quarterback or win because the offense just don't lose games and, and that's how they were kind of looking at it and i think it's kind of flipped their defense has been really you know mediocre so far throughout the season i mean they're probably bottom 10 in in everything right now and uh injuries don't help with that but you know i, I do think that they've reached a point where this is kind of the do or die game for dalton and if he plays poorly again and it's going to be tough with all the injuries, but I think they're at a point where they got to probably look at it after this week and say, you know, like, do we go back to Jameis? Do we see what he looks like if he's healthy? You know, if they lose this game, I think playing for 2022 is kind of out the window a little bit, <laughs> even in a, in a bad division. Like, it seems like 
you know, everybody's alive in this division right now, but it's not because they're <laughs> staying alive. It's just because nobody will kill anybody. Like, someone just needs to kill somebody. Uh, well, and, that, uh, that game tried us last night, didn't it? Uh, <laughs> oh, man. That was horrible. <laughs> Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, seven wins doesn't put you out of the South right now. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm sure it, it's tough to answer with any level of certainty, but Dennis Allen talked about how Kenny Pickett was their top-rated quarterback in this, this past draft class. And from a Steelers fan perspective, there was some thought New Orleans may take Pickett ahead of uh, Pittsburgh, do you feel like there was actual interest in Pickett? Obviously, they didn't take and they took uh, Alave and, and Penning. But what do you think? Do you think this team had had serious interest in, in Kenny Pickett? Oh, yeah, for sure. They they definitely did. They liked him. Uh, they met with him a few times. And, um, you know, I think it was definitely something that they were considering for sure. I think if they hadn't had a coaching change, I think the odds of Kenny Pickett being in, in New Orleans might be uh, even higher. I mean, I think um, the former coach liked him uh, a lot and, and kind of saw him as someone that could be part of uh you know the, their future and what they do here so that there were a lot of traits that they liked with him I, I think you know the way he kind of plays fits into their ideals on, on offense and that's definitely something that 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 was uh something that they that they wanted to potentially do obviously they went a, another direction went Chris Olave and and Trevor Penning and um you know we'll we'll see how they feel about those decisions in, in, a, in a you know a couple of years uh not getting a quarterback this year in the draft was definitely something that was interesting and then not having a pick next year for them is it's going to be uh it's going to be tough for them but yeah he's he was definitely on the radar well that Taysom Hill uh thought you know when 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 used the way they you know correct correctly and uh we've seen him you know in a lot of various situations he's kind of that Swiss army knife kind of player if you will and I think the Steelers are even trying to emulate him this week with Mitch Trubisky of all players if you can believe that and and, and good <laughs> luck with uh good luck with that but with this being a short week and on with them kind of being banged up and you know you see some of them uh, they they like to run the power with the uh with the guards pulling uh with Taysom Hill in the backfield and all like that and obviously you could have two different guards out there but overall, uh, what we have seen on tape in, in, in the last, let's say, about three weeks with this offense, uh, with how they use, you know, Taysom Hill, it, it, you wouldn't expect. And then I, I, and on, let's see, what was it on Wednesday? I think they, he, they did not practice because they had an estimated injury report there. What you see is what you get right now uh, on the tape with, with how they use Taysom Hill, right? Yeah, I mean, the. The biggest mystery every week is just how much they're going to use him, and that's really been one of the more confusing things with their their offense. I mean, some games they get him really involved, and sometimes they don't. And the way they're playing and where they're at, I mean, I think they need to be giving him the ball as much as possible. Like they had a third and one run last week, and they run power, but it's with Alvin Kamara, and it's just like if you're going to pull everybody in, then you got Taysom Hill. Who I you know I think it's probably fair to say that their QB power with him is probably one of the hardest plays in the league to stop, especially for a yard. If we're talking about a yard, is the variable? Like I think he averages like five point six yards per carry on those plays throughout his career, and it's just you pack everybody in, everybody knows it's coming, and he just he does it and it succeeds. They don't give him the ball there, which which is just a, a huge mystery to me. And he played seventeen snaps last week. Granted, a, a lot of that stuff ended up being in, in, you know, their offense overall. They were in a lot of hurry-up situations. He's not really part of that package, so it's tough to get him in there. But I just don't understand why there just doesn't seem to be a commitment every single week to get him the ball. And if he qualified among all, you know, they, they got the, you have to have X amount of carries to qualify for the the rushing title or to be in the on the leaderboard. If he had a few more carries, I looked a week ago, he would have been leading everybody in the NFL by a full yard in yards mm. per carry. Just get him the ball. Like it doesn't need to be overcomplicated. Just look at him like a, a running back. You know, if you're giving a direct snap to him and he's he's running it, what's the difference between that and handing the ball off right. to, to Alvin? It's just it's a running play at that point. And they just need to treat him like like he's a running back and you know that can throw every now and then. And you know, maybe every 12 touches he throws the ball down the field just to keep the safeties backed off just a little bit. So you got a little bit more breathing room. But that's that's really the only thing here is like are, are they gonna give him the ball or not? Every week seems like a good week to give the ball to Taysom, but they seem to overthink that a little bit. 
the, the Steelers have had problems giving up explosive plays. In fact, I think only one other team, uh, I think it's the Falcons, have given up more explosive plays than the Steelers are 20 yards or more. Uh, the Steelers obviously coming off of a, a, uh, a smarting against the Eagles where they were able to push the ball uh, vertically, uh, and the Saints have some nice speed. I mean, uh, you know, when you look at Callaway and, and even uh, Rashid Shaheed, uh, some, some explosive guys, and then Alave, obviously a first-round draft pick, uh, I guess the uh, you know, the protection issue would be the biggest thing. But do you expect this team to to finally? I mean, you, we saw I think a little bit of a Yankee concept against the uh, against the Arizona Cardinals a couple of weeks ago, and what you know how greatly designed that was. And Andy Dalton put that ball right on the money there uh, in 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 the middle of the field. Do you expect them to try to push the football uh, down the field, or will they try to small ball this thing and get the ball out quick from Dalton in this game? I mean, I think they'll probably try a couple shots, but I, you know, I'm expecting more small ball, especially because of the injuries that you mentioned. I mean, it, it, I don't think that that you know play action might not be very viable in this game if you can't protect very well uh, in the middle. So, I mean, it's it's not been a huge part of their identity so far, but they've been well timed with them at times. Chris Olave is really good down the field as well. You mentioned Rashid Shahidi; he, he's you know he's really really fast, so he can get down the field in a hurry. So you could take a shot there without really having to pre- protect maybe as long with, with some other people. If there's a vulnerability there, I, I do think that they'll probably try to find a way to to get to it. But I, I don't know, you know, with, with this offensive line, I think it's going to be tough to, to maybe get to that aspect of the game. To flip over to the defense, what makes DeMario, da- DeMario Davis so effective? Watching him on tape, and this guy is just never misses time. It's not missed a snap the entire season. Eight tackles for loss, six sacks. What makes him such an effective guy to blitz and just seem to be an all-situations type player? Yeah, like six sacks, I think, this season. Yeah. 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 I, I that might be a career high right now, too. I, I'm not sure I'd have to look at that, but I think I think five point five maybe was the previous high. I could be wrong. Um yeah, I, I think he's just incredibly intelligent. And you just kind of watch him play. He's just he's a right place, right guy type of player. And I, I think just that quality from a football player is so underrated. Just I, we've watched so many linebackers come through here that just kind of weren't assignment sound, got out of their gaps, tried to do too much, freelanced a little bit. Quan Alexander is a, a good example of that type of player. Really great skills, but just kind of just didn't have that ability to be consistently in the right places at the right time. And, and that's something that, that DeMario does really well. Um, you know, I think with the blitzing, he just has a, a really, really good feel for that and just kind of knows how to how to time them up and be patient and just kind of wait for the right moment to attack. And, and, you know, he never looks like he's in a hurry on those plays, but he gets where he needs to be in a hurry once he sees what he wants to do. And, you know, he, he's, he's, he's the one player and, and it's kind of weird to say this, but like, I feel like he's gotten better with age. Like he got here later in his career, improved in this system. And I think just like his intelligence and, and his ability to, to read the field and that just keeps getting better. And it's kind of helped him, offset the aging process a little bit. Like I'm sure if you, you watched him now and you went back to his first year with the saints, like the range probably isn't quite the same. And you know, that some of the, some of the speed and the burst probably isn't quite the same, but like his anticipation and, and all that stuff, I think has done a, a really, he's done a really good job of kind of offsetting that a little bit and just kind of, kind of making it so that you don't really see where he's, he's lost a step because he's figuring out how to make up for it. Um, you know, he's, he's kind of the heart and soul of this team, honestly, and, and post Drew Brees, like the leadership and all that stuff too. You know, I, I think it's kind of, I, I don't really like those conversations about int- intangibles because it's like hard to measure those things, but there's definitely a, a quantifiable value with just kind of what he's brought to the locker room in terms of trying to preserve a, uh, identity post Brees. Um, you know, last year they, they did a better job of that in, on the, uh, the, the record sheet, but, um, he's still just, just you know, really, really kind of become the identity of their team. One of those hearts and smarts players. Yes, for sure. Definitely. My last question, then I'll let Dave finish things out. Uh, Saints have a fair amount of sacks, about average league-wide, but only two interceptions, and both by the Honey Badger. Why is this defense struggling to seemingly take uh, the football away and know their last and turnover differentials? So just overall, why is this defense maybe not making those splash plays? I, you know, I think it's it's a few things. Um, You know, Marcus Williams is, is definitely somebody they miss, and I, I think he kind of helped just with everything in, in coverage. And they've kind of had to try to find a new identity there in, in the secondary after losing him and uh, Malcolm Jenkins. The other thing too, look, I, I think it kind of really goes hand in hand with the the injuries. Um, 
not having Marshawn Lattimore and, and, um, you know, they lose CJ Gardner Johnson trade that's self-inflicted. That, that was a thing though, for sure for them. PJ Williams was injured in the, the secondary. It's just, th- there's been things that they haven't been able to do up front. I think, you know, their pass rush hasn't been as aggressive. Like their blitz numbers are down. Their stunt numbers are down. When they do all those things, they're still extremely effective, but they've been more conservative up front, which I think is kind of allowed for quarterbacks to not get forced into certain situations. So now their coverage isn't getting the same opportunities to make plays. And it's just kind of, you know, all that stuff kind of, I think, plays together a, a little bit in they just haven't been healthy. If they get healthy, maybe they can dial some of that stuff up and it and it changes um, some of the stuff they do uh, a little bit. The other thing with that too is, is you know, Paulson Adebo's year two, he was hurt while playing. Um, he played through a, a ankle and, and knee injuries and he missed time as well. Now they got Alante Taylor at the other spot. His coverage has been pretty sticky. I, I do think that there is going to be some point, like his passer numbers against her are really good right now. You watch his tape, though. There's definitely some stuff he's doing that I think could be exploited a little bit. And I think it's kind of like a a race between the adjustments, and nobody's exploited it yet. But like sometimes on on you know curls and, and some in breaking r- routes and stuff like that, he gets going a little bit too fast downfield. He doesn't have bad hips. It's just the recognition of it is sometimes a step late, and you see like massive separation, and and just nobody's taking advantage of it yet. And I'm just kind of waiting for those moments to to come to see. Uh, if somebody can and how he adjusts to it. So, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's a handful of things that I think just really, uh, I don't know, man, like <laughs> it's week nine and, and there's a lot of stuff about this defense that that's just really kind of confusing right now. Overall. I mean, they were always so, so sound under Dennis Allen and he's still running the defense and it's just, it's a little bit weird to see them get away from a lot of the things that, that made them really great. And it's hard to to pinpoint any one thing. I think it's just like a bunch of little things and, and, you know, it is week nine at this point and we kind of keep talking down here, like, Oh, like if they turn around, they click in, they can be this, they can be that. Like, I think we're, we're kind of reaching a point in the season where it just kind of is what it is injuries or not. Everybody has them. And, um, you know, little things like tackling and details and all that stuff just kind of seem to have gone to the wayside a little bit this season. Man, you know, the good thing about having beat writers on who who are really in tune with the team like you are, Nick, is sometimes it confirms some of the stuff that we see on our end when we study the tape. And normally I don't reveal any of my five keys of the game until Saturday post. But one of my keys that I already have written up this week that you just kind of hit on uh, is pick on a Debo. Uh, now that the Steelers have parted ways, you know, with, 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 you know, obviously Chase Claypool, we expect, you know, Pickens, uh, the rookie to have a little bit, you know, more targets in this and just looking overall, Paulson Adebo's had his moments though, uh, you know, going back to last year, but it does seem at times he's kind of fallen off, especially with, with, with wide receivers that can a either double move them, I guess, and get kind of vertical or just those that are very good route runners, such as Deontay Johnson here. So you would agree that, you know, this might be the week for Kenny Pickett to, and really the Steelers game plan in general to kind of go after Paulson Nadebo on, 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 and I don't, you know, I, he doesn't switch sides too much. I don't think, does he? No, they're pretty stationary. Him and Alante right. Taylor kind of, kind of play their sides. Yeah. I mean, he, he's, uh, he had a really, really good camp. I, I thought he was going to take a huge leap this year and then he got hurt. He had an ankle injury. He came back, he hurt his knee, missed time. And he's been okay the last few weeks. They just really haven't really gotten tested too much. Like Lamar Jackson wasn't really out on his receivers too often. The big issue last week with coverage was coverage by, by the safeties and they got disorganized back there and they were just kind of leaving open space. So it is possible for sure that he's kind of gotten healthy and gotten back to that form and he's, and he's playing well, but he hasn't really been tested since coming back from that injury. And I, I, I do think that there are, some things that, you know, if it, if a team can get to them and get after them with some of that stuff that you just mentioned, for sure, I think it's something that they they should try to do. And like I said, on the other side, Avante Taylor, he's physical. He's he's done a really good job since coming in uh, in place of Marshawn Lattimore. But I think that there are some things that I would try to see, okay, has he covered this up? Has he fixed it? Did he make these adjustments? The, the, uh, the first start he had, there were a handful of things. And then last week against uh, Baltimore, they got him on a curl. That was one of the things that I kind of saw him uh, susceptible to. And then they never really got back to it. So I think if somebody tried to like consistently get after a couple of these weaknesses, just to see if they exist, like, I think there's some factor fiction here, but it's worth finding out for sure, given kind of how both of them have played so far. 
All right, Nick, uh, you got the Saints on a short week. You got the Steelers coming off of a bye. Uh, you know, the, kind of hopefully, you know, the Steelers need, needing a get right game, if you will. Uh, all that said, the week started off, I think the Saints like two and a half point uh, road favorites in this one. Obviously, some injuries might play play a part in this. Uh, which way do you have this going? You want to throw out a prediction for us for Sunday? Ooh, man, it's so tough because I, I have no idea what their offensive line is going to look like or anything. And, and given that, like, I think it's just, I think it's just is is Watt playing? Like it seemed like he was he was Yeah, they they're, they're going to they're going to probably activate him on Saturday before 4 o'clock. So that'll be a last minute move and if he's out there even though they're claiming that he might might be on the snap count, you're not gonna, you're not going to put TJ Watt on a snap count. You know, another thing we didn't talk about, you got Rams going against Watt. And those two went to Wisconsin and and obviously were first round draft picks and I think the last time uh the only other time they met was in 2018. I think Ryan Ramsick handled him for the most part, you know, in that game four years ago. But I, I you know, uh, short answer is what's uh, going to probably play this week. Yeah, just given given that and the injuries on the offensive line, I I think that I'd lean Steelers a little bit in, in this one. Um, you know, I think it's imperative that Saints get out to an early lead and, and hold it and they've got to be able to run the ball. I don't know if they're going to be able to run the ball with those injuries. So I, I, I just think it's going to be a tough week for them. Um, and they're going to have to prove it to me in, in, in this one. Uh, Nick, tell uh, everybody what you're doing over at New Orleans Not Football. We uh, got the all the analysis, the film study. We just hired Mike Triplett from ESPN. Um, we're just trying to build uh, the base, the best uh, fan experience, the best analysis that that people can get uh, on the Saints. All right, uh, we'll get people to follow you on Twitter. And uh, Nick, uh, look, we appreciate on this Friday you sitting in and uh, helping us preview this game. So uh, with that, Nick, thanks for joining Alex and I on the Terrible Podcast. Thank you, Nick. Thanks for having me. And welcome back to the Terrible Podcast. And again, our special thanks to Nick Underhill. One last time, you should follow him on Twitter at Nick underscore Underhill. That's underscore then Underhill. And let him know you heard him on the podcast. Appreciate his time. Know he's a very busy man. and. I know he's gone the independent route like Steelers Depot. He's doing a great job. So we love to see another fellow independent site uh, doing great work. Absolutely. And boy, you want to talk about clean connections, man. <laughs> that guy, that guy, uh, I don't know what he spent on, uh, uh, on, on, on his setup and all, but uh, it sounded like he was right in the same room. And Lord knows we've done enough of these things connecting over Zoom and Skype over the years and all like that. Uh uh, I had to compliment him at, you know, after we got off the, off the air there because the sound quality is just absolutely fantastic. Man. So uh, glad to have him on with us, uh, help previewing the game. For sure, for sure. All right, Dave, let's preview the game ourselves as the Saints sitting at three and six will travel to Pittsburgh this Sunday to take on the two and six Pittsburgh Steelers. Are the Saints still two and a half point favorites in this game? Uh, no, it, 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 it is moved now uh, and, and it moved a couple of days ago uh, or uh, I think at least yesterday, one and a half points right now. Saints road consensus road favorites by a point and a half. Still hard to see how they're the favorites in this one, but I guess just because Pittsburgh's offense has been that miserable. But we'll start. Let's start with the Saints offense in this one. Andy Dalton, uh, the more things change, the more things stay the same. Andy Dalton will come back to play Pittsburgh at least one more time in his career. And as Nick outlined, maybe maybe playing for a starting role because of the offense struggling in recent weeks. Dalton not playing as well. The team uh, potentially could turn back to Jameis Winston. So um, what sticks out to you the most when watching the Saints offense, Dave? Yeah, just uh, how they use Taysom Hill. Uh, guy has six touchdowns. Uh, uh, I even had this kind of in my in 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 my write up of the six keys or the five keys for the game uh, ahead of this. Is uh, you look at him, he has uh, only played 130 total offensive snaps so far this this season. Talking about Taysom Hill, and he has helped produce. 460 total yards of offense on those 130 snaps by either throwing, rushing, or receiving. Uh, not only that, he's helped produce uh, five of the Saints' 33 total explosive plays of 20 yards or longer this season. Uh, uh, they enter Week 10 having averaged 6.34 yards per running play whenever Taysom Hill is on the field for a running play and 8.74 yards per passing play when he's one of the 11 players on the field. So uh, 
<laughs> when he's out there, boy, you better pay attention to him. And they, they, they do everything under the sun, uh, with him. They'll, they'll obviously put him in a wildcat, you know, uh, situation there. Uh, they, uh, you know, and let them run out of that. They'll run power out of that. They'll run inside zone out of that. Uh, you they'll they'll line them up outside and, 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 and run a quick screen game to them that way. And this is a guy that's like, a you know, a linebacker slash fullback slash running back slash quarterback <laughs> slash, I mean, uh, you He's not the, he, he's not all that quick as much. He's quick for 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 his build and, and his measurables and all like that. But it's, he's just such a physical player, and he does have kind of I, I you know uh, deceptive long speed. I think as well as well too. You've seen him bust one down. I think the uh, the left side on some tape there, and him actually kind of run away from players once he gets into the open field. So uh, this is a guy that when he is on the field, you better be wary. Uh, of where he are, where he is, and what they're trying to do with him. Because once again, they'll, uh, you know, they'll use him as a decoy. But they're 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 obviously not afraid to put the football in his hands in any situation in here. So this, you know, to me, that's that that you know, it goes on with the obvious because they they do have a good running game in Kamara, and everybody knows about Kamara. I think at this point, Kamara is a guy that even on some of these inside zone runs, you want to talk about a guy that's still able to hit it quick. He he does and. Uh, I think just because of the window dressing and how they utilize Taysom Hill, uh, boiling it all down, stop the run, just period. Who, right. who, 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 whoever's back there, Kamara, uh, Hill, you got your number one focus has got to be stop the run. You want Andy Dalton has to have to drop back and pass as much as you can in this game and especially in long situations because, uh, that's when Andy Dalton makes mistakes and has made mistakes over the years. Hale really is one of those leather helmet type players in the sense of he should be playing in 1941 running the single wing offense. And cause I mean, he just does it all. He's kind of an interesting player. And I just wonder logistically how Pittsburgh will classify him because the way that defenses typically respond to offenses is based off of their personnel. So typically 11 personnel, three receivers, you're going to be in your nickel defense against two tight ends. Typically, you're going to be in your base defense. How do you classify Hill? Is he, a, is he a running back? Is he a tight end? Is he a receiver? Is he a quarterback? He can and has been all of those things on a given play. So I wonder how Pittsburgh will try to match up. Maybe that's where you'll see some of that three safety stuff come right. in for Casey to kind of be able to wear all those hats, stop to run, cover, do whatever he has to do. So um, that's certainly a possibility, but certainly um, and they've gotten Hill, I think, more involved since they moved Andy Dalton. He's thrown the ball at least once in his last five straight games. It seems to happen, and it really has happened more in oppos- opposing territory. So once the Saints cross the 50, first down, second and medium, that's when Hill may be a threat to throw the, fo- the, the football. That seems to be the trend so far. But yeah, I just wonder schematically how Pittsburgh plays that chess game against Hill in particular. That could be a really big, um, big point and matchup in this game. And boy, when they get down in the red zone too, they're not afraid to use them at all. So that that, that what, what uh, where do they enter in uh, red zone? They they've got to be great in the red zone. Uh, let me pull it up here. They are eleventh in in red zone offense at sixty percent. So pretty good, yes. And Hill okay. has five touchdowns. Four of them have come inside the ten. Only one has been inside the five. So he's been able to score from you know eight yards out, seven yards out, stuff like that. But yeah, he's got uh, by far the most rushing touchdowns on this team. And that takes wear and tear off of Kamara too by not having to use him you know down 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 sure. low like that. But uh, it will be after you know. Once this game is played, it'd be in, 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 well, especially, you know, by inactive time to see who's active and inactive on the offensive line. Uh, they are, to me, they're going to be, you know, it, it, it could, it could highly impact this game for obvious reasons. If, you know, they don't have McCoy, if they don't have uh, Pete, uh, Throckmorton, I don't know what you thought about him coming out, but, uh, very much a backup type player, if you will. But we right. have seen sometimes over the years, though, right? Where we've seen some offensive lines come into games against the Steelers, uh, beat up and with fourth string player, third string players, and they end up, you know, holding their own there. So, uh, but this is definitely a matchup, you know, it, it, uh, uh, where I think you try to take the running game away at all costs, you know, try to keep a cover of things on the back end here and, 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 don't give Andy Dalton time to push the football down the field. 
And in the past game, take away Chris Olave. He's been really good for them as the, as a rookie and with Michael Thomas on IR, Jarvis Landry. Sounds like he may play in this game, but in terms of the, the downfield threat, it's really been just Olave. So can you run some bracket coverage on him on some of those situational football uh, moments, third downs? I think you take him away, you force the other guys to step up, whether that's, I mean, their receiver group is not looking particularly strong besides him. And so if, if you can take him away and really force his team to, play left-handed, maybe blitz the linebackers to keep Kamara in. You're going to rely on their, you know, not A players or B players, but their C and D players to step up and make plays. Yeah, look, they've got some speed. They just, they, they don't, they don't, they're not able to use it all that much. Yeah, they're, I mean, you know, who was the one guy you mentioned, Rashid? What's his name? Rashid Shahid. Yeah, he had a touchdown last week, didn't he? Against Baltimore or two weeks ago, somewhere around there, I want right. to say. Um, and then Jawan Johnson's a former receiver, moved to tight end, and he can be a vertical threat. So, I mean, they do have, I think, Traquan Smith. I mean, they do have some guys there, but um, generally speaking, it's been really just Alave and Kamara. And so if you can take those guys away, and that's easier said than done, of course, but that's where the attention, the focus needs to be. Um, you do that, the Saints offense will struggle. All right. Last point is just this offense gets pretty creative and has a lot of different wrinkles. They'll go by go four by one, do some really weird looking kind of stack and bunch sets and things like that. That's so a how weird, you, that's a weird three player stack. They do on the yeah, outside. Isn't right. It? And it's got Hill with the RPO component. And so, I mean, how do you defend that? How, what are your bunch rules and things like that? I mean, you know, I think you'll have to have to have a good, uh, uh, uh clean and sound game plan to try to defend some of that stuff because you'll see some funky looking things from the saints offense. Well, uh, and we didn't talk about this in it. James Pierre probably going to start opposite, uh, Cameron Sutton in this one, right? Well, you got Levi Wallace. My, my thought is Levi will start, but I think Pierre plays to some extent. I don't know. I think Pierre's, you know, and, and you talked about this. I, you know, I, I think Pierre's probably earned, earned, earned the right sure. to maybe start in this one. I, I wouldn't be mad. I mean, I would do it. I want to see as much uh, from James Pierre as possible. So if they start him, cool. But I just wonder how that's going to work with Wallace. I mean, it's just hard to gauge that right now because Wallace has been running ahead of Pierre all season. He's been hurt. So we'll have to see. But I think Pierre's earned the opportunity. Absolutely. All right. All right, flipping over to the Saints defense, and as uh, Nick and we've outlined some injuries there as well, it does seem like Marcus Davenport's going to play in this game, so they should have him, but Pete Warner, their top tackler by far, he's got 70-something tackles, the next closest guy, Demario Davis, only has 50, so Warner has been really their dude making all the plays this year, and they've had a lot of injuries in the secondary to Lattimore, and as you mentioned, Marcus May and others, and so um, in terms of what scares you the most about the Saints defense to start there. What is potentially potentially the biggest problem area they could pose to Pittsburgh? You know, I, overall, I just think if you hold on to the football and let that pressure get home, you know, I, I, I think this is a defense that can be run on. They don't blitz a lot. They don't take the football away. I think more than anything is just where uh, find a honey badger. You know, uh, like a weird, <laughs> exactly oh, to be my phrase. Yeah, like like a like a where instead of where's Waldo, where's the honey badger? Because they'll they'll obviously do some things with him and rotating down and and uh, robber type situations and. You know, where is he on the field? Uh, it will, will, might be one of the hardest things that Kenny Pickett has to identify uh, on, on Sunday here. Uh, other than that, I mean, especially without Warner in there, you know, and, and, and you know, Davis, obviously, Demario Davis is, is all over the place. Now, I think this is a secondary that can be exploited. Uh, as we talked about with, 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 with Nick and this game, you know, one, as I identified and revealed early is one of my five keys. I think a Debo is a guy that you can, uh, potentially go after and, and with either wide receiver, I'm talking about Deontay Johnson or, or, or George Pickens. Uh, uh, I, I try to run George Pickens past the Debo a couple of times in this game, and especially they end up playing a lot of, you know, a lot of man type situations. Uh, in this now, overall, they haven't been bad about keeping the lid on things. I, you know, I think overall, but uh, quite honestly, especially with Warner out of there, and and we'll see what happens with uh, Marcus May and his injury situation there. It, it's not a defense that jumps out at you, I don't think overall. So I, you know, I would say that uh, the Honey Badger is one of the biggest concerns overall, and that's just finding out where he is on the field. 
they have some bigger, longer corners on the outside. And so can those guys turn and run? It's going to be the question there, potentially, maybe even some of that short area stuff as well. Can they, you know, be able to cover the slant and, and choice routes and things like that? But yeah, my answer to what the biggest threat is for that Saints defense is two words, honey badger. And you got to find 32 every single uh, snap. They rotate a lot. Um, he's a guy that certainly I think is probably licking his lips, facing a rookie quarterback, trying to bait him and goad him into into making a mistake. And so Pickett's done a decent job this year reading coverages. I think some, some of the post-snap looks have given him trouble. And so I think you'll see a lot of post-snap rotation and changing that picture um, uh, for the Saints and with Matthew in particular. But but that'll be the big thing overall is being able to identify him, making sure that Matthew's not a guy that's making all the plays and is drawing the headlines of this game. Boy, if, if, if ever there was a, you know, a, a time to get the running game right. <laughs> this yeah. this would, would be the week, you know, because uh, if you can, if you can keep that defense of theirs, you know, uh, guessing in these, you know, short, you know, to medium type range on second and third downs and all, I think you can have success. I think that opens up your passing game a little bit more, put, put, uh, uh, get the saints in, in as many man situations as possible and let your, let, let, you know, let, let guys like Deontay Johnson, who can get a lot of separation, uh, do that. And, you know, Pat Firemuth should have a nice matchup in this game as well, too. And, you know, they, they've talked about maybe using the middle of the field more. We'll see, but, uh, this, this could be a game, uh, especially if Warner does, doesn't play. I mean, this could be a nine reception game for, for, for Pat Firemuth, I think. Yeah, could be, um, I mean, I'd like to think the Saints run defense has not been very good this year, but the the Steelers run blocking has been uh, just as bad. And so it's really more about Pittsburgh fixing their problems. They still got some veteran guys and Cam Jordan. They slant, they shoot gaps. Well, the Mario Davis to me has been one of the more underrated players in football for quite some time. And he's the guy that's really being used as a pass rusher, kind of a Vince Williams type player overall. Um, So, you know, can this team run the ball? I think it'll be more inside trying to get the ball in the perimeter is going to be tough. The, The Saints tack well in the perimeter. Um, and so I think trying to get the ball outside, not ideal. So just run between the tackles in those B gaps, get downhill with Jalen Warren. That's going to be the the ticket for Pittsburgh this weekend. Will we see our first 20 yard run of the season? Well, history says no. So I'll, I'll say no, but are you going to be the optimist here? Yeah, I am. I, I okay. it's going to come, it's going to come from Jalen Warren too. All right. Uh, but I, I think, uh, I think, uh, I think they might crack one. Of, and look, we haven't really, we talked earlier in the week about Steven Sims and all like that. There's another guy that, uh, interested to see maybe what he can do out of the slot here. I'd like to see a couple of slants run for a change uh, and, and, and actually attack the middle of the field and, 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 you know, maybe not so much down the field, but in that 10 to 12, 15 yard area there, uh, I think they're a little bit susceptible to that. And, you know, there might, who knows, you might get some communication issues or something because of uh, different personnel on the field defensively. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I want to see how they use them. It'll be some of the jet run game potentially and RPO and, you know, swing passes and things like that. But I'd like to see a couple of slants as well to get him in space. And, and so we'll see what that looks like there. Just some overall, slot, some slot fades, you know, to him because he showed you want to throw, can, you want to throw a slot uh, fade to Steven Sims? Uh, yeah, I think you can. I just, I like to usually like to throw this to bigger guys. I think just, he can get can separation he, in there. I, I, yeah. I, I really do. And I think there's a couple of instances on tape with him back when he was with Washington that, that, that he can do that kind of stuff. So yeah, okay. I, you know, I'm, you know, obviously you're not going to do it six times a game, but I, uh, if, 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 if you get the right type man situation in that, yeah, run it. All right. Fair enough. Um, from the saints turnover aspect, I mean, they have not done a good job in the turnover category. They've, they've given the ball away a ton offensively. They only have, I think it's seven takeaways defensively, but only two interceptions, and they are dead last in the NFL in turnover differential at minus 10, and they are um, tied for the league lead in giveaways with 17. So I know Pittsburgh's had their problems with the turnover battle as well, but with the return of TJ Watt, I mean, you like to think you take care of the football, you should be able to win this game. You know, they tried to quick snap a couple of times on the Baltimore Ravens and that ended up biting them in the, in the, you know, what, a couple of times, both, both passes got tipped and one of them got intercepted. So, uh, get those hands up on that defensive line. Yeah. Th- Dalton th- th- had th- three th- passes batted in that Ravens game by defensive lineman. Mm-hmm. And you know, that's a, I don't know who's going to be the, odd, here, here, uh, Who's going to be the odd defensive lineman out in this game? Cause surely it's going to be one of those guys as the fifth fifth inactive, I would think, right? Is it going to be Aluwalu? Is it, you know, might it be obviously Ogan Joby's help will decide whether or not he's active or not. But if Ogan Joby dresses, 
and, and, and plays, who's going to be the odd defensive man out, defensive yeah, lineman a, out? Good question. My first thought goes to Loudermilk, um, but I, Alu Alu has not played that well. But also, would you really have just kind of one nose tackle? I mean, Cam has kind of played some nose tackle this year. So my guess would be Loudermilk, but but that's a good question. Okay. And, and to your point, I mean, Pittsburgh's D-line, they've not batted many passes down this year. They did it no. earlier this year, and then mm-hmm. since then, I mean, Cam Hayward has tried to get his hands up. That's one reason why his pressure numbers are down. He's seen those double teams. They have not batted passes. They were doing it routinely last year, and so some of that's just, you know, right place for a time, an inch or two, you know, makes all the difference, but you like to see that change because uh, it's it's not really been effective this year. Yeah, Tyson Alualu has a history of being able to do that, and obviously he hasn't been playing all that great this year. Or playing that much, yeah, mm-hmm. seeing his role reduced there for sure. So any other thoughts here on the Saints? Again, um, on paper, it looks decent for Pittsburgh, although, again, when, you, you, when you're a Steelers offense averaging 15 points per game, and with Kenny Pickett in his three full games, they're averaging 8.7 per game, nothing else really matters unless you can just put some dang points on the board. Yeah, and, you know, come on, I guess the only other thing I would say, and, and this is going to be another thing probably in my keys to the game here, is uh, – Let's see them limit those unforced penalties, you know, th- this sure. week. Uh, the the uh, the false starts, the delay of games, the ineligible man downfield, the illegal motions, the illegal formations. Those those I was surprised how many uh, in, in, in total you add up all those kind of unforced uh, penalties, if you will. 20, uh, 21 unforced penalties by the Steelers offense this year. Of I mean, the uh, six fault starts, six ineligible man downfields, three delay of games, three illegal shifts, three illegal formations, and a partridge in a pear tree, I believe. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, this offense, even whenever they're playing mistake free, is still probably pretty bad. And then you throw penalties and those mistakes on top of that, and they just, you're in an impossible situation. So the last thing this team needs is, is to hurt themselves. And they've done that far too often this year, especially to me, the last two games. 11, 11 drives were killed of the, in, in, in those 21 unforced penalties. Mm. Yeah, that's, that is just brutal. That's a great stat there that really highlights how sloppy this team has been. Okay. All right, Dave, uh, I think that probably wraps up the the preview pretty well. We do want to make our picks for that game and the rest of Week 10 here in a moment, but let's hear from our friends over at MyBookie first. Let's do it. You know sports, and you pick winners all the time, so why not get paid for them at MyBookie? MyBookie has the biggest online selection of odds and contests for all your sports betting needs anytime, anywhere. Bet on the NFL, NCAA, or swing for the fences with the brand new money bag feature that they have. The MyBookie money bag is a -a one-of-a-kind opportunity to spin for crazy odds on props and futures. Just place your bet, spin the wheel, and get ready to score epic odds on the best teams, athletes, and events. You can sign up at MyBookie today uh, and for free using promo code TERRIBLE. That's promo code TERRIBLE. And in doing so, you can claim a deposit match of any amount up to $1,000. Again, that's promo code TERRIBLE to claim your deposit bonus and give yourself the competitive edge you'll need. It's not just a sports book. It's a community as well. You can bet anything, anytime, anywhere with MyBookie at MyBookie.com. AG. And we are both 0 and 1. You shouldn't have listened to me because I picked you initially picked Carolina. Yeah. And held hands with me to pick Atlanta. Yeah, I just I started looking at thing. I, I did too, I I went way too deep into my research there. I had too much time in between kickoff and, mm-hmm. and us letting each other know which way we're gonna go there. And I flip flop and what a disaster of a game that was, by the way. And uh Marcus Mariota, I mean he he didn't look great. You would think at some point they're going to turn to 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 Desmond Ritter. Right. Uh, uh, but once again, you know, the Steelers play both of these teams in, in the month of December. Uh, <laughs> they, ought, they ought to have a chance in both those games. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> there are going to be some 
games that are very only interesting to local markets uh, only. When the Colts uh, come, actually, uh, I think it's in Indy, but uh, Colts, Panthers, Falcons, there'll be some some real barn burners for the Steelers to to watch the rest of the way. Yeah, and look, as, we, as we've kind of talked, the first half of this season was going to be uh, tough on the Steelers, but you turn to the second half, it it, uh, it certainly looks like there's, there's some winnable games. Everything outside of the AFC North are games that, you know, because the Raiders are, are another team in there, and you mentioned the Colts. I mean, there's there's a good six games, like the five or six games in here that you think, man, if, if, if they can't beat them, you know, uh, it's even worse than maybe what we thought it might be. And I think we both had this team at like, I don't know what, eight, nine or something like that before mm-hmm. the season started and all like that. But uh, I, I'm expecting them to win a couple games this week. Uh, all right, uh, on, to the, on to week 10, the rest of week 10 action. Seattle Seahawks at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, man, the Rams let the Buccaneers off the hook <laughs> last week there. Uh, all that said, the Buccaneers are are two and a half point home favorites against the Seahawks. I mean, Tampa Bay's offense has just been so stuck in the mud and the Seahawks have been the surprise of the year and kudos to Pete Carroll, kudos to Geno Smith. I got Kenneth Walker running well. Give me Seattle. I don't know how you, I, something sounds wrong about this. And every time I say that and go the other way, I get screwed. So I'm going to say, I'm, I'm going to let the wrong be wrong. I'm with it. Give me the Seahawks uh, plus two and a half. I, I think Seahawks should win this outright. Uh, Jaguars at the Kansas city chiefs, only nine and a half points, just uh, chiefs favored by nine and a half uh, at home. Well, the Jacks had the great comeback against the Raiders, so kudos to them. Trevor Lawrence, I think, has played better and, and maybe playing a bit better than their overall record indicates. Uh, end of the day, though, I got to go KC in this one. I got to go KC and lay that nine and a half points as well, too. The Houston Texans on the road against the New York Giants. Uh, Giants laying four and a half at home against the Texans. The Giants just find ways to win, and I saw that they're, what, the second luckiest team in the NFL, only uh, behind Pittsburgh. Somehow the Steelers are the, are the quote-unquote luckiest team in the NFL, and also two and six, but but putting that aside, uh, the Giants keep it rolling. So you uh, have them covering that four and a half, right? Yes. I will go that way as well, too. A later four and a half on that. Uh, next up, Browns at the Dolphins. Uh, the Dolphins, three and a half point home favorites against the Brownies. You know what? I'm going to say the Browns at least cover in this one. They're going to play ball control. They're going to keep the ball on the ground and, and maybe minimize the chance that Tua has to, to run the show. So I'm not quite sure who wins, but I'll take the Browns in this one. I'll take the Dolphins lay to three and a half points. I think they take it to them pretty good in this one. Minnesota Vikings against the Buffalo Bills and, and Josh Allen not going to make it in this one. And, and uh, it doesn't sound like it. It sounds like he's going to potentially miss this one. Bill's still favored by three and a half over the surprising Vikings. Yeah, I saw um, McDermott say that Allen's hour by hour. So whatever that means right now, I guess just game time decision. I'll go Minnesota. I'm though. hour I'm by hour. I'm, I, I have the <laughs> definition of hour by hour. Yeah, uh, but I'm going Minnesota. You know what? Give me the bills in this one. Uh uh, a couple of turnovers or something like that. I'll lay the three and a half in this one. Detroit Lions at the Chicago Bears. The Bears laying three points in this one. Yeah, kudos to Chicago. They've really allowed Fields to, to be an athlete and run with the football, and they put up points, and um, they've kind of come out of their shell a little bit. And, and the Lions defense has still been historically bad despite beating the Packers last week. So give me Chicago. I'll take Chicago later three points as well, too. Denver Broncos on the road against the Tennessee Titans. Titans uh, laying three at home in this one. Yeah, Ryan Tannehill should play in this one. That'll allow them to have some sort of a passing offense. So give me the Titans. Although Derrick Henry's a little bit banged up, but but also go, still go Tennessee. I'll go Tennessee and lay the three points in this one. This that that has push written all over. That's going to end up being a three point game. Uh, Raiders hosting the Colts uh, and Raiders laying four and a half. Uh, here in Vegas against the Colts and new head coach Jeff Saturday. <laughs> still, still weird That's to say weird. overall. Very weird. I uh, the Raiders are just hemorrhaging talent. Wall is on IR. Renfro is on IR. I mean, Adams is still there. I don't need. This is not a game I'll be watching. I'll tell you that much. You know what? I'll screw it. I'll say the Colts with Saturday somehow find a way to win this. I don't win know. Win it! Do wow. It, 
I'll go with the Colts. Uh, I'll go with the Raiders late a four and a half uh, on this one. Dallas Cowboys at the Green Bay Packers. Uh, Cowboys on the road, four and a half point favorites at Lambeau Field. Mm, your best facenda right there. Uh, yeah, give me give me Dallas in this one. I mean, I've tried to go with the Packers. That offense just has been so dead in the water. Rodgers has not played well. Receivers have struggled, have been hurt. Give me the Cowboys. Damn it, I'm going to stay on the Packers here. <laughs> you can't quit them. Pa- I, I can't. Packers going to win this outright, too. I'll, give me that. Give me those four and a half points here. Uh, let's see here. Arizona Cardinals on the road against the Los Angeles Rams. Rams laying two points in this one against the Cardinals. Yeah, not looking like a great game. Doesn't look like Matthew Stafford's going to play either. So I don't even know who's starting. They said Walford and Perkins are splitting reps. They probably wish they had a Mason Rudolph right now, I would mm. probably guess. Give me Arizona just because I don't know how Walford and Perkins with that offense wins a game. Yeah, give me the Cardinals uh, to win this outright. So I'll take the two points on this one as well, too. The Chargers on the road against the 49ers. Uh the, the Chargers are going to be uh, waving on Monday, uh, Jerry Tillery. And uh, if you go to the trusty old what the Steeders look for uh, uh, annual post by Alex Kazora, uh, he Tillery's one of those guys that just missed checking all the boxes there. He has the body type, uh, has the pedigree and all like that. The problem is, is if you, yeah, you, you know, they, they should be high enough in the waiver wire order to maybe claim a guy like Jerry Tillery. But, uh, you know, where, where does the roster spot come from? Yeah, Don't think it's going to happen there, but certainly the pedigree I'm sure is on Tomlin's radar right now. Uh, and they had, uh, you know, everybody, but Tomlin, I think at that pro day in, in uh, at Notre Dame in 2019, uh, Colbert and, uh, you know, you, uh, I think, uh, Terrell Austin was there at, 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 at that one for the Steelers. But anyway, uh, 49ers at home hosting the chargers, the 49ers are seven point home favorites. Oh, it's a big line there. The Chargers are a team I can't quit either, but they still beat up at receiver. They just that offense has been so conservative. It's a big line, though. I'll say the Chargers find a way to cover, but the 49ers win. I'll take the 49ers late as seven points there. Uh, Washington Commanders at the Philadelphia Eagles. Eagles laying 11 at home. And, and aren't they coming off of a long week at that? And Jalen Hurts thought he was going to be a... A Steeler uh, back back a couple years ago. Yeah, it really should have been. Minka Fitzpatrick was pushing forward in Pittsburgh. Hurts thought it was going to happen. Well, what could have been? I'll say Washington finds a way to cover. Heineke has that kind of just scrapper mentality where that game's close, divisional type game. Philadelphia still wins, but I'll, I'll say Washington covers. Man, give me the Eagles all day on this. I'll, I'll lay the 11 points on this one. Uh, let's see. I think that's it, right? Yeah. Uh, other than... <clears throat> that circles us back to the Steelers hosting the Saints on Sunday. As we mentioned, uh, Saints one and a half point road favorites over the Steelers in this. What you got? Yeah, the way that I laid it out is if Pittsburgh can't win this game, then what game can they win with a even with a you know, quote unquote easier schedule the rest of the way? I mean, you got TJ Watt coming back, Steelers on a bye, uh, some time to kind of get away from just all the, the crappiness of the season so far. Saints on the road, short week with with their own, you know, pretty key injuries. Pittsburgh probably not dealing with as many critical injuries as New Orleans appears to be. So overall, I got Pittsburgh scoring uh, 23 points and the Saints 20. So I got the Steelers winning this one by field goal. Yeah, and that's exactly what I have written down. One, uh, 23, 20. Exactly. I think that's like the second time this year we, we, we've scary. matched uh, exact point totals in here. Uh, I think they'll be able to run the football a little bit better in this one. I think they get a couple of more explosive plays in this one. I think they get uh, uh, Andy Dalton maybe to turn the football over once or twice in the short field. Uh, there's no re the, the Steelers are. You know, as bad as the Steelers have been, getting Watt back, yada yada, it just it feels like they're the better team. And in, in, in injuries and every and everything points in their favor. The short week, everything, man. Uh, if there was a week to make money on the Steelers, uh, it's this week, I think. So yeah, give me the Steelers twenty three to twenty. Uh, I haven't picked the Steelers many times this year, but I'm I I, I was dead set on doing this the moment. Uh, really, the really the line came out because of the Saints being on the short week and all like that. Mike Tomlin, zero and three against the Saints for his career. So mm. I, I think Tomlin can become. I uh, don't quote me on this. 
I think like the 14th different head coach to beat 31 other different teams in the NFL. Look, so there's there's look, 13 of us. I'd be surprised. I'm surprised the number's that high. I think that is. Look, uh, look that one up there, stat boy. <laughs> <laughs> You're like Tim Rice. You guys are always awarding me around to look stuff up. I, yeah, I wouldn't uh, figure that number would have been that high. Uh, Alexa, yeah, I, I thought I saw something somewhere on that uh, uh, weird stat for – uh, but anyway, it'd be interesting. I, I didn't have time to flush it out, though. Okay. Yeah, I know that the Saints are the only team that Tomlin's not beaten, besides, of course, the Steelers. So I, I, I didn't think it'd be that many other people he'd be joining in terms of beating 31 teams. If you had all of NFL history when you had eight teams, maybe I could have could have bought that. But right. interesting stat there. Well, obviously, but what Belichick's done it. I mean, we could probably start rattling off some. Um, Harbaugh's, Harbaugh's probably done it, right? Yeah, is he? I, I mean, I really, I don't know. besides it, Belichick, I really, Sean Payton, maybe, I guess, probably, maybe did it. I don't know. I, I think Pey- Payton did it. Yeah, I think he did. Okay. Uh, anyway, I'd be interested to see what you find on that. Cause, I, you know, as you mentioned, pro- probably not many people do it. And Mike Tomlin's 0 3 against the Saints. So, uh, anyway, that's where we're at on the picks. All right, Dave, let's get to read emails and close out today's show. All right, let me sort out. Uh, look good. I don't think we have many of them to get to. Caleb uh, Zabrowski. Good morning to the best in the business. With Claypool traded, how many more snaps could you see Pickens getting? And also, did they take Pickens' quick development into consideration when trading Claypool? Thank you for everything you do. Look, I think Pickens is still a very much a player in development. I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't quite say just yet that Pickens. I wouldn't label. Pickens is a quick developer just yet. Would you? No, I think there was what he is. He is what he was, I guess, at this point. Yeah, there's still some rawness to his game. I think just on its on its face, Claypool for a second was for a high second. It appears too was a, a deal too good to pass up. But there'll be recognition as well that maybe that allows Pickens to be a bit more of a consistent presence in this, in this offense. And so that, that move wasn't made solely because of that. I did kind of put my tinfoil hat on for one of my terrible takes and say, this was kind of a, a money ball Pena had kind of situation where Claypool was seeing some targets and they want Pickens to get the ball a bit more. And so they deal Claypool out, but again, they did not give Claypool away. They got tremendous value for him. And so that's, that was the, the catalyst for why that deal got done. And look, I think they were already close in snaps, Claypool and Pickens, uh, before the trade uh, happened there. Uh, somewhere within, I, I forget the total, kit, but it was very, very close with the snap count. I mean, look, you're, you're going to see Pickens on the field a little bit more, but uh, it wasn't like he wasn't on the field a lot already. Right. Uh, different positions. And again, Claypool just doesn't did not seem like a good fit. Wasn't an outside guy. Clearly not a slot receiver. What do you think of Claypool's comments he made to NBC Sports Chicago saying he felt like he wasn't schemed well in this offense and really wasn't given the chance to make big plays? I mean, he's been given an opportunity to make a few plays and hasn't. Uh, I mean, there's with this offense. Look, this, this offense is already dysfunctional. as I, I don't. I don't think they were purposefully scheming away from. I, I there were you know who he should be mad at is Kenny Pickett because Kenny Pickett has not not gone to him in a couple of situations where it looks like uh, uh, Claypool has been open. So whether it's read progression or or what have you, I they weren't purposefully scheming away from him. That it, you know that makes zero sense there. But if if Claypool wants to be mad at anything, it should be mad at Pickett for not seeing him a couple of times. Then mad at himself for losing out on those opportunities. You had the the first pass that Pickett ever threw was a deep ball to, to Claypool, where he didn't he loses out to a five eight safety pass, gets picked, had the slot fade against Miami, where yeah the feet got tangled up, but still a deep ball opportunity that had an interception, a really negative play. So if, if every if every chance to you downfield is becomes negative, then they're going to stop doing it. And, and yeah, playing inside in the slot limited those opportunities like you would get on the outside. So. I understand that to a degree, you know, Claypool was playing a different position that asked him to do some different things, but Claypool has got to look in a mirror and say, Hey, I, I, I left a lot mm-hmm. on the table the last two seasons. Right. And, 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 you know, there, there were instances where maybe he, you know, on, on kind of like some over routes and stuff like that, where, where Pickett probably could have hit him. Sure. Yeah. Th- I mean, there's, there's probably some, you know, nugget of truth to that. And again, playing in the slot, your average depth, the target goes down, the routes you're running are a lot shorter, a lot messier. So I get that, but Again, uh, Claypool, end of the day, did not capitalize on the chances that he had. And had he done that, then he would have gotten more plays downfield. 
Right. And maybe he even brings uh, more, more value in, in as a tra- uh, you know, in a trade on top of it. Although second, uh, I never saw that coming. I still, still, still can't believe they got that. Uh, Mathena writes in, uh, I was listening to Tomlin's press conference the other day. Some of the questions were rather stupid. Some questions were good, but the answers were typical coach speak. My question for you is if you guys each had one or two questions you could ask Coach Tomlin or anybody in the organization, uh, what would you ask him? Assuming, of course, you'd get uh, 100% honest and detailed. We we get a question like this like once every four months, right? Where where what would you ask uh, if you could ask and and be guaranteed, uh, uh, you know, a, a truthful response? Uh, Mathena writes in for me personally. I'd like to know whether the team conducts post draft autopsies and everything associated with that process uh when do you when do they usually conduct those and if so what have been the takeaways from that in other words what did what what did they get wrong or overlook in their analysis of say Kendrick Green and are there certain traits they put too much stock in uh did they ignore some red flags and if so why I, I don't know if I would, and he says, your, your turn, what would you guys, I don't know if I got my, that I've thought long and hard about what I would ask in, 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 you know, in these situations here. Yeah. I, I don't have one specific question. It'd be, a, it'd be a week to week type of thing. And maybe something that I saw or, 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 you know, heading into a game kind of thing. I think if, if, if I was to ask questions. Yeah, I've always had the thought of if I was in one of those press conferences on a more weekly basis, I would try to ask two questions. One would be something relevant to the to the week, and then one would be kind of more of the overarching question about maybe football philosophy, kind of like what Belichick occasionally gets asked, although I don't know how well Tomlin would answer those. And even, I mean, I understand the question is hypothetically, what if you could get a perfectly honest answer? But did you see the... um? When Pete Carroll got asked that really in-depth football question the other day by that, uh, his name's Matty Brown, does a, a great job covering Seattle and the X's and O's aspect. And Carroll's like, man, that's a great question. Like, who are you? What, 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 so that's a fantastic X's and O's question. And no, I'm not going to answer it because he didn't want to give away whatever answer that was. And so even asking some of the high-level stuff occasionally, I think, causes coaches to realize, hey, I'm not telling you guys my game plan. Right. And, you know, some of the stuff I think I would ask was uh, who, who was to blame on this, you know, and Mike is right. not going to play. He'll play the blame game, blame game, uh, I'm sure, in the meeting room. And, you know, we've heard stories about that from players uh, getting put up and uh, uh, the fish or whatever, you know, uh, the donkey or whatever they, uh, they, they, they call it there. But you're not going to get that kind of response uh, out of uh, out of Mike Tomlin, I don't think. No, but uh, wherever there one day, then then we'll see how that goes. Uh, Dave in Chicago wants to know what's the aversion to using the fullback as a lead blocker in Pittsburgh. Uh, he says they've been trying to fix the run game for years now, yet to have the highest paid fullback in the NFL on the roster sitting on the bench. I get that the position is largely being phased out. Uh, but don't tell the Niners and Ravens who have their fullbacks playing. Look, I mean, the Ravens do things a lot different than they can because of the mobility, obviously, uh, and you, you got a guy uh, uh, in Ricard that can do what he can do. Uh, Derek Watt, uh, he says, uh, as opposed to a measly 5% for Derek Watt, it's just amazing to me that nobody in the organization is apparently can. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you. And and look, e- even even in even game situations, you're probably not going to use Derek White a lot. But this rolls back to that stat I've been rattling off the last couple of weeks here. When when 45 percent of the plays that at least Kenny Pickett has run this year, dropbacks have been trailing by you know 14 or more points. That that's not conducive to having your fullback in the game for starters. Right. And there's a bit of a misnomer. I mean, Watt is a fullback, but he was primarily signed for special teams work. I mean, that's the core of what he does. He is a four phase special teams kind of guy. And there's a fullback component that he can he can offer to to a lesser degree, but he was less signed to be a fullback for the Pittsburgh Steelers and really be like the next Tyler Medikevich. And whether or not he's become that guy is debatable. I don't think he's been this amazing special teamer of the DHB or Medikevich level, but that's where the focus really needs to be in terms of what he's considered a, a special teamer more so than a fullback. Look, Rosie uh, Roosevelt Nicks in his prime was a much better, just pure fullback than Derek Watt. And I think maybe a bit better special teamer. So, I mean, Watt's a good one, but but probably not a great one. 
Uh, you know, and, and I think there's a couple of stories. I think Ron Cook's got one on Derek Watt this, this week and all like that. This is going to, to me, that this is going to be it for Derek Watt in Pittsburgh this year. Right, right. I mean, I don't think the value is enough to, unless he wants to come back super cheap, but not at the current price point. Uh, let's see, Ryan, uh, I think I hit on this from Ryan Kane, talking about Big Ben's rookie games and all like that. So I think we've gone through all these questions here that we have in the box, Alex. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, we will be back on Monday recapping, hopefully a win, man, <laughs> uh, uh, against the Saints here. And let's see what you guys have got the scouting reports up for mm-hmm. offense and defense uh, up this morning. So and we should have a lot of great other uh, content. There's obviously going to be a roster move or maybe two on, 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 on Saturday. We'll see if there's any uh, elevations and the game obviously at one o'clock Eastern. So that'll make a full day on uh, Steelers Depot with uh, obviously posts related to the game and, and afterwards. So uh, in the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter at Steelers Depot, follow Alex on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazora, follow the show at terrible podcast, email the show, the terrible podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate to the cause, go to studiosdepot.com, hit the donate button. Also get an ad free version for $25. Go to studiosdepot.com, hit the ad free button up right navigational bar. So until Monday, as always, thanks for listening to the terrible podcast with Dave and Alex.